In the last video, we saw intermolecular hydrogen atom abstraction by excited ketones from hydrogen donors. In this video, we're going to look at intramolecular hydrogen atom abstraction in which the hydrogen donor is internal to the molecule containing the excited ketone. This is also known as the Norrish type 2 reaction in honor of its discoverer, Norrish. And it's a very important process for ketones in particular that contain gamma hydrogens. So you'll also hear this referred to as gamma hydrogen abstraction. Since the hydrogen that is abstracted is often in the gamma position with respect to the carbonyl group. And there's a very good reason for this that we'll see here very shortly. Hydrogen abstractions that are intramolecular from other positions can also occur, particularly under geometrically constrained circumstances or circumstances where we don't have a gamma hydrogen, but those reactions are generally much less common. The fundamental idea of intramolecular gamma hydrogen abstraction is the same as intermolecular hydrogen abstraction, the notion that photoexcitation puts an unpaired electron or radical character on the carbonyl oxygen that's electrophilic in nature, and so a nucleophilic CH bond in the vicinity can become involved in a hydrogen abstraction process, generating a ketal radical, and in the case of the intramolecular reaction, another carbon-centered radical, more typically. This is a diradical or biradical intermediate, and at this point we're on the ground state potential energy surface and the primary process is complete. Just as in the case of intermolecular reactions, the major orbital interaction here is between the sigma orbital of the hydrogen donor, sigma CH, and the electrophilic half-filled N orbital in the photoexcited carbonyl group. And various things can occur from this biradical intermediate. Radical-radical coupling can take place to give a cyclobutanol structure. Fragmentation can occur to give an enol and an alkene, and the enol typically tautomerizes back to a ketone. And back hydrogen abstraction can occur to get us back to the starting materials where the overall process looks like non-radiative decay of the excited ketone. These are all secondary processes that occur on the ground state potential energy surface. And what takes place depends on the reaction conditions, the multiplicity of the excited state, whether it's singlet or triplet, and various things like this. And even within a particular type of reaction, for example, within this coupling reaction to form cyclobutanols, the stereochemical outcome depends on singlet versus triplet, since our rates of pairing, our rates of radical recombination, are affected by singlet versus triplet. And the need for intersystem crossing is also affected by singlet versus triplet. One thing I should point out before moving on is that the gamma hydrogen is the one abstracted in most Norrish type II reactions. And there's a good reason for this that has to do with the structure of the resulting transition state. Notice that as a bond forms between oxygen and hydrogen, we're generating a six-membered transition state here. Six-membered cyclic transition state, which is associated with a relatively stable geometry. Note the familiar chair structure of cyclohexane here. Because this cyclic arrangement is relatively stable, stable even with respect to a five-membered ring arrangement, this is going to be the fastest hydrogen abstraction that can take place intramolecularly in most cases. The resulting diradical is a 1,4 diradical with two carbon-centered radicals separated by two intervening carbon atoms. In terms of digging deeper into this reaction, we're interested in, as we mentioned, the effect of spin multiplicity, singlet versus triplet, on the reaction outcome. We're interested in the effect of the electron configuration of the excited state, in pi star versus pi pi star, and on how reaction conditions affect the outcome, things like solvent, temperature, and the like. So first, let's look at structure reactivity relationships within the photoexcited ketone. As we saw in the intermolecular case, the n pi star state is more reactive than the pi pi star state. The basic reason for this is that the n pi star state has that unpaired electron on oxygen that's really doing the business of the hydrogen atom abstraction process. More accurately, it's the half-filled electrophilic n orbital in the n pi star state that's doing the business. The pi pi star state lacks that orbital. And we can see that in this data. Notice, for example, that the quantum yield of in tromolecular hydrogen abstraction, or IHA, is much lower for these compounds containing pi pi star lowest triplet states, completely undetectable in the case of this one, relative to those within pi star 
excited states. The rate constants are also, generally speaking, much lower. So the data supports this claim that n pi star is more reactive than pi pi star. Notice also that the substitution pattern of the carbon bearing the hydrogen that is transferred matters. And the relative reactivity of transferred hydrogens follows the order of radical stability in terms of the radical that will be generated on the carbon of the CH bond, with tertiary CH bonds being the most reactive, followed by secondary, followed by primary. That we can see in the rate constants of quenching in series where all we've changed is the number of carbon groups linked to the gamma carbon. So for example, in this first case, we have a gamma carbon that is a methyl, simply a CH3. Here we have secondary with one carbon group linked to the gamma carbon. And here we have a gamma carbon that is tertiary with two carbon groups linked to the gamma carbon. Notice the increase in quenching rate constant that occurs as we move down this series. A manifestation of the greater radical stability as we go from a primary to a secondary to a tertiary carbon radical generated in this process. In looking at singlet versus triplet reactivity, we can zero in on dialkyl ketones as molecules whose singlet excited states have relatively long lifetimes due to slow intersystem crossing. We see that S1 is also reactive in gamma hydrogen abstraction along with T1 and in molecules for which S1 has a decent lifetime, these dialkyl ketones. We do observe that the rate constant of quenching of the singlet state is much higher than the rate constant of quenching of the triplet state, implying that S1 is generally much more reactive than T1 in these reactions. And this is true despite the lower quantum yield in some cases because the efficiency of hydrogen abstraction can be much lower for singlets rather than triplets. Just briefly as a reminder of why intersystem crossing is relatively slow in these dialkyl ketones, remember that the key is that our S1 state is n pi star in electron configuration, pretty much purely n pi star in the case of acetone. And the T1 state, which is fairly close in energy, also has n pi star configuration. And so intersystem crossing is relatively slow because these orbital configurations are the same in the lowest excited S1 state and the lowest triplet state. The state energy diagram actually helps us explain why the S1 state is generally more reactive than T1. And this is a commonly encountered pattern actually in photochemical reactions that S1 is, is more reactive. The reason is simply that S1 is higher in energy. The energy of the S1 state is greater than the energy of the T1 state, meaning that photochemical reaction leading to the same ground state products is going to be more exergonic or more exothermic in the case of the S1 state rather than the T1 state. But remember not to confuse reactivity, the rate constants, say, of quenching with efficiency in the form of a quantum yield or quantum efficiency. If, for example, hydrogen abstraction is followed immediately by rapid back hydrogen transfer, we can get back to the ground state of the reactant with no net reaction, resulting in an overall low quantum yield despite a high rate constant for the hydrogen transfer process in the forward direction. That's essentially what's happening with these low quantum yields of the singlet state, for example, observed in this case. Back hydrogen transfer, particularly driven by the fact that we're generating a primary radical here, makes this quantum yield very low for the singlet state relative to the triplet state. Once we're in the triplet state, of course, back hydrogen transfer becomes a lot harder because we can't get back down to a singlet ground state without intersystem crossing taking place. A couple of slides ago, you may have noticed numbers in parentheses. Those were quantum yields in different solvents. The main number was in an alcohol solvent, and the number in parentheses was in benzene. And this is a pretty interesting phenomenon, that the quantum yields of gamma hydrogen abstraction products are often higher in alcoholic solvents. This is attributed to hydrogen bonding between the new OH group and the alcoholic solvent. So for example, following Norrish type 2 reaction here, we would end up with a 1,4 diradical intermediate that looks like this. We have created an OH group in this intermediate, and as such, that OH group can hydrogen bond with the alcoholic solvent. This interaction with the solvent prevents the transfer of the hydrogen back to this carbon, which encourages this to go on to products where, for example, the radicals couple or 
we get some kind of photo product out of this process. And so whatever follows generally has high efficiency as a result of the hydrogen bonding. Further evidence for hydrogen bonding comes from reactions of gamma stereogenic ketones where the gamma carbon is a stereocenter. When this ketone is irradiated in benzene, we observe racemization at the gamma carbon because we form a planar carbon-centered radical that can then receive the hydrogen back through a back hydrogen transfer process on either face, leading to a racemic mixture of the two enantiomers. The same is not observed in terbutanol. This is because of this hydrogen bonding interaction, which dramatically slows the ability of this bond to rotate and actually prevents racemization. Any back hydrogen transfer that does occur is going to occur without rotation around this carbon-carbon bond, leading to retention of configuration of the starting material. So far we've focused on the generation and dynamics and structure of the biradical intermediate, but of course what happens to that biradical intermediate is key to the final closed shell products that we get out of these processes, whether we observe elimination, cyclization, or just return to the starting material. Because the triplet state generates these biradical intermediates very efficiently, we tend to think about this in the context of triplet reactions, and the Distribution of products and the fate of the biradical intermediate depends on two factors. First of all, there's the population of possible conformational isomers of that biradical. What conformations are accessible and what are their relative populations when the reaction events take place? And the second is the intrinsic rate of intersystem crossing in each of those conformations. And we should expect them to be different. For example, these Gaussian anticonformers would be expected to have different rates of intersystem crossing because they have different distances between the radical centers. And return to closed shell ground state singlet products is going to depend on intersystem crossing taking place. So a typical situation is this gauche anti-dynamic that you see on the slide. The diradical can have either a gauche conformation where the two radical bearing carbons are in a gauche arrangement. If we think about this in sort of a Newman projection way, there's a 60 degree dihedral between the carbon-carbon bonds here and here. And there's another possible conformation where the radical centers are essentially anti with a 180 degree dihedral between them like this. Although we would expect intersystem crossing in the anti-conformer to be relatively rapid because the radical centers are relatively far from one another, for that exact same reason, because the radical centers are far from one another, we see no cyclization from this conformation. And it's also impossible for this to revert back to starting material because the hydrogen, which was transferred from the gamma carbon, is now very far away from that gamma carbon. And so only elimination occurs from this anti-conformer. From the gauche conformer, now the radical centers are relatively close to each other, and so intersystem crossing is relatively slow. However, we have open to us multiple pathways. Cyclization, which is really just radical coupling, coupling of the radical centers to form that cyclobutanol ring, is now enabled because the radical centers are close to each other. Reversion is possible because the hydrogen is now relatively close to this radical electron at the gamma carbon. And elimination remains possible because we have the orbital interaction required for elimination between the radical centers and the central CC sigma bond. And so all three possibilities are open to this gauche conformer. And what we actually observe depends on the number of gauche molecules and the number of anti-molecules, as well as these relative rates of intersystem crossing, which must occur before any of these processes can take place. So it's complicated, but we can at least understand the dynamics in terms of these key variables.